welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Amen. God is good. Well, we're going to get into the word of the Lord today. I believe that God is going to speak to you. He's going to speak to all of us, really build us, equip us, encourage us. But it doesn't just happen because you sit there and do nothing. No, you've got to put your interest, put your attention in, and get ready to hear from God. Listen, you didn't come to hear from me. Oh, thank God, because I don't have anything to say. Didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, or any of the color you could imagine, from the tall, the short. Listen, doesn't matter. Let's get off a man. Let's get on to God. So prepare your hearts to hear from the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church. Stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, today we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, what an awesome time praising you and worshiping you. God, we're thankful that we get to come into the house of God freely and lift our hands and sing to you, God, and just love on you, Lord, as you love on us. Thank you for your presence in this place, as you promised that where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them, God. So we believe that you are here, and uh, Father, we're just grateful to be in your presence. God, we ask today that as we open your word, that you would open us up to receive it. God, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. Lord, we'll do our part putting our interest and our attention in God. We know that you'll do your part putting the word of God deep down on the inside of us and causing it to come alive. Lord, may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives, God. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide. Show us great and mighty things to come, God. We pray, Lord, that you give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction that we need for our lives, Lord. We give you the praise and the glory for that. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for our brothers and sisters, Lord, all those that are preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters. We love them. Pray that you bless them as you bless us this day. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. We see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together, building one kingdom, and that's yours. God, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. Go ahead and get a hold of your Bible as you're having a seat. Open up to the wonderful text of Hebrews, the fifth chapter. We've been in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, for quite a while. For those of you that are just joining us for the first time, we go line upon line, precept upon precept, as the Bible says to We believe that God wrote it that way. We ought to understand it that way. And so we've been going through the principles here in Hebrews chapter number five, and we've come to a section talking about maturity, talking about growing up, talking about becoming a mature person in the things of God. Hebrew church had, had, uh, the Hebrews that were being written to in the church scattered abroad were, were starting to regress. Instead of progressing, they were regressing it. And the writer of Hebrews says, this time you ought to have been teachers by now. You should have had such a good grasp of these things that you should have been able to teach others as well. And yet you need someone to teach you again. And this is where we come to today in our study in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse number 13. It says this. It says, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now, if I could remind you of some of the thoughts, you remember we talked about milk. Talked about milk as the first principles of the word of God. That those that are babies, those that are immature, are the ones who partake only of milk, like the text said. See, those that are mature, they don't put away the milk and say, I don't need that anymore. No, they still drink milk. They still incorporate it into their lives. But they also have solid food that they incorporate, and they go on to maturity. Now they are pouring into others' lives and teaching others. They're able to handle solid food, and that belongs to mature people. And so we see that one of the differences between an immature Christian and a mature Christian is that they partake not only of milk, but also of solid food. Why? Because they are not unskilled in the word of righteousness, but they are skilled in the word of righteousness. The title of today's message is Skilled for Life. Skilled for Life. See, as a mature believer, we have to get a hold of the skill from God's word for our lives. Let's take a look at the verse once again. Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse number 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now, as I take a look at that, I I see a couple of words that I want to draw out. Number one is unskilled. Unskilled. That means that they don't have the experience, they don't have the wisdom in life. For what? It says in the word of righteousness. See, that milk is the first principles of what? The word of God. The solid food is, is the mature believer's food that comes from where? the word of God. So we see that these people were unskilled in the word of righteousness. They didn't have the wisdom of God applied to their life. And you could say, as you look at that word righteousness, you take a look at that. I love how it says it in the Old English. In the Old English, you will notice it's even spelled differently. And and the root of the word comes from right 
wiseness. That's how they used to say righteousness. It was right wiseness. It was a wisdom for living life. And so if we're going to get skilled in the word of righteousness, that means that we have to take the word of God, get a hold of the principles of the wisdom of God, and start to apply it in our lives. Are you listening today? Now, in the dictionary, if you take a look at wisdom, you'll find two basic definitions. First of all is having or showing experience, knowledge, and good judgment. Now, we, we understand that we say many times people uh, grow older and with age comes wisdom, right? We, we know that saying. And, and, and a lot of times people say, you know, just, just as you get older, you'll start to get the wisdom that you need. And yet, hold on a second. Does that mean that I could cryogenically freeze somebody when they're born and then break them out 60 years later and they're going to come out with wisdom? Well, no. Why? Because it's not just age. There has to be something that happens. Sometimes people say, well, you know, really wise people learn from their mistakes. And that's, that's really what it's all about is going to the school of hard knocks. And as you go through that, you'll gain wisdom. Yes, you'll gain some practical insight. You'll learn some things to do, what not to do. But have you noticed that it didn't say that just because you have experiences, that that's the only thing that gets you wisdom? See, it's unskilled in the word of righteousness. So it's not just about our experience because we could... Learn something from life, learn what to do and what not to do, and miss out on the wisdom of God's word. So others would say, well, the truly wise are those that learn from other people's mistakes. You can learn what to do and what not to do, and yet again, we miss out on the application of the word of God, because what if they did something, they messed up, they failed, and we said, oh, I won't do that, but they failed trying for God. They failed doing the right thing. Oh, now, that doesn't compute. We say, well, if you do the right thing, you won't fail. And yet, I see plenty of people in the Bible that did the right thing, and yet it looked like failure. My goodness, even Jesus went to the cross, had all of his disciples leave him. What happened? Did he fail? No, he was doing the will of God. And so we can get confused looking at the worldly wisdom when we take a definition like having or showing experience, knowledge, and good judgment. Well, what about the other definition of wisdom? Well, responding sensibly or shrewdly to a particular situation. So we could say, as I look at this situation, I know how to act. That's wisdom. Yes, that's worldly wisdom. That's just the basic level of wisdom. As I was studying this out and searching this out, uh, I came across a book on Proverbs by Pastor Bob Yandian, great teacher, uh, great man of God. And in his book, he said this. Now, I want you to get a hold of this because I believe that as you hear what he writes, that it's really going to unlock some understanding as we get into what we're talking about today. This is what he said. He said, experience alone is not enough to teach us wisdom. Everyone has experiences, but not everyone profits from them. It is the word of God which we use in the experience of life, which actually teaches us wisdom. The word is like a nail, an experience like a hammer driving that nail home. The harder the experience, the more we should lean on the word and the more wisdom is driven down deep into our hearts, one day it will become an inseparable part of us. See, that's what the Word of God is talking about, that we need to get the skill of life. We need to get skilled in the Word of righteousness, the right wiseness of God, not only a position with God of righteousness, but now the practice of God's Word in our everyday life. So a mature person is one who gets wise and skilled and is able to respond to life circumstances. In fact, I want to give you a definition for wisdom today as we go. I'll put it up on the overheads for you, and that is wise equals skilled, which equals the ability to respond to life with God's Word. If you're taking notes, go ahead and write that down real fast. It's there for you up on the overheads. Wise equals skilled, which equals the ability to respond to life with God's Word. See, if we respond to life with anything other than God's Word, we're not going to get the results of God's Word. We could respond to life with our own thoughts, with our own ideas, with our own ways, maybe the ways that we were raised in, the ways of the culture or the society around us. We could respond to life the way that we were educated or trained, or we can respond to life with the wisdom of God. Are you listening today? Wisdom is our responsibility, not anybody else's responsibility. You don't get it by just coming, sit in church, I wave a magical wand over you, all of a sudden you have the wisdom of God. I wish I could do that. I'd, I'd do that to myself if I could. But it doesn't work like that. Wisdom is our responsibility. We have to get a hold of it. In fact, the Bible commands us to get wisdom at all cost. Let me show it to you in the book of Proverbs. Turn there with me. You're there in Hebrews. Turn to the Old Testament. Right about the middle of the Bible, you'll find the Psalms. Right after the Psalms, you'll find the Proverbs. 
Proverbs chapter number four. And let's take a look at this together. Proverbs chapter four. Proverbs chapter number four. We're going to take a look at verse number five through verse number seven. Proverbs chapter four, starting in verse number five, says this. It says, get wisdom. What are we supposed to get? Wisdom. Oh, you got to stir yourself up today. I know some of you guys didn't set the alarm and you should have been here at the first service, but it didn't happen, so you're here at the second service. That's okay. Listen, you got to stir yourselves up today. Not just sit there and, and, and spectate. This is time to participate. Okay? So let's try that again. Get what? Wisdom. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Look at verse number six. Do not forsake her and she will preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. Now, the, what, what's going on in the book of Proverbs, actually, if you read the context, if you read around this, you will find that wisdom is pictured as a woman that is crying out from the rooftops to everybody who passes by and is compelling people and telling people, come and get your wisdom. Come and find what, what I have for you. Come and get the right way of doing life, God's way. And so that's why it says in verse number six, do not forsake her. Do not forsake wisdom. And wisdom will preserve you. Love wisdom, and wisdom will keep you. Wow, that's pretty awesome. But take a look at verse number seven. Wisdom is the principal thing. So what is the principal thing? Wisdom. Wisdom, wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the priority. Wisdom is the first thing that we should be seeking. Wow. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. See, we're commanded to get a hold of this. It is our responsibility. And isn't it like God to not only tell us what to do, but also to give us an incentive if we do it? See, God knew that we were incentive-driven. He knew that we would have that what's-in-it-for-me mentality. You know, I'm not going to do something that I don't see the benefit of doing it. So God says, I want to show you what the benefit of wisdom is, and I'm going to make it so lucrative, so enticing, so advantageous for your life that you will just want to get a hold of it, that you will be running to get a hold of it, that you will get a hold of it at all cost. You want to see the incentives? Well, you're there in the book of Proverbs, chapter number four. Turn to Proverbs, chapter number three. Maybe just look to the other side of the page or turn a page over. Proverbs, chapter number three, starting in verse number 13. Proverbs, chapter three, starting in verse number 13, talking about the incentives of getting wisdom. Proverbs 3, 13 says this, happy. Everybody put a smile on your face and say happy. Happy, happy is the man who finds wisdom. Wow. There's an incentive. And the man who gains understanding. Now look at verse 14. For her, or wisdoms, remember her is wisdom in this scenario. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver. And her gain than fine gold. Now hold on a second. See, in our economic uncertainty of the times that we're living in right now, a lot of people pulled their money out of the stock market. They said, I lost too much. No more 401k. I can't afford to lose anymore. So they pulled all their money out of that. And they said, I'm not going to invest in real estate. The bottom fell out of the real estate market. People are underwater. Everything's upside down. It's not recovering, and cash is king. And unless you got that, don't invest in real estate right now. There's no money to be made in the law. See, see we, we just can't invest. So what did they do? They started investing in gold and silver. So much so, in fact, you can't turn on the TV without seeing somebody telling you to buy gold. It's the only solid investment right now. Buy American gold, right? And, and they got these gold bars and these bricks, and they're showing Fort Knox and all that kind of stuff, and they're wanting you to buy gold. But I'm here to tell you today that there is something that yields a better profit, that it has a better margin, that the gains are much greater than silver and gold, and that is according to the Word of God, the wisdom of God that will profit you and bring gain into your life. Wow, let's read on. Verse number 15, for she is more precious than rubies. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. And this next part of the verse just blew my mind. When I read it, I just thought, that is just crazy. That, that's just wild that God would make a claim like this. But take a look at what he's saying. Remember, incentive. God wants us to get a hold of this because it's going to bless our lives. And it's, gonna, it's, it's just going to take us to a whole other level. Are you listening today? And all the things you may desire. Wait a second. Hold on. 
Can somebody tell me what all means? Oh, hold on, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Can somebody please tell me again, what does all mean? All, all means all. All the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Oh, my. See, we've got a lot of desires. A lot of things we want in life. And yet, all those things that we want and desire can't compare with wisdom. Wow, incentive. Let's read on. Let's read on. Verse 16, length of days is in her right hand. A lot of people are looking for the fountain of youth, looking for a miracle pill to keep them young, a little nip and tuck, right? Everybody's trying to stay young. And yet, wisdom, wisdom will give you length of days. We've been seeking the wrong things. In her left hand, riches and honor. How many people do we know that have been seeking fame and fortune? Riches and honor. They're looking for wealth, get rich quick. They're looking for fame. They're looking for the approval and, and, and the praise of man. And yet all they had to do was get a hold of the wisdom of God. And in her left hand are riches and honor. See, we're out there working, striving, toiling, going through all this trouble. Why? Because we want to get rich. We want to be honored among men. And yet, if we get a hold of the wisdom of God, riches and honor come with. Wow. Wow. Oh, but it doesn't stop there. Verse number 17. Her ways are ways of pleasantness. And all her paths are peace. See, people are disturbed, people are stressed out, people are anxious, and everybody's looking for something to numb their pain. Sometimes people turn to a bottle because they want peace, and that's the only peace they have. Sometimes people turn to a drug because they say, I just can't deal or face my reality, and therefore I've got to go somewhere else. And so they turn to a drug. Some people turn to the arms of another find themselves in the bed of somebody wondering what they're doing. Why? Because they're trying to numb their pain. Some people look to the internet. Some people look to fame and fortune. Some people look to their job and they're a workaholic. Some people look to their family and they just go and that's all they do is that, is that all day. And yet, if you want pleasantness in life, if you want life to be sweet and you want peace in your life, there's only one place you're going to find it and that's in the wisdom of God. Wow. wow. Verse 18, and she is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. And happy, see, we started with happy. Now we're ending with happy. And happy are all who retain her. See, I've been looking everywhere else, trying to find life and all these things, all this stuff, so many distractions in the world. And yet, God says, if you come and get your wisdom, Come and get a hold of it. What's going to happen? She's a tree of life to those who take hold of her. See, Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. He is the tree of life. And when we partake of him and his wisdom, now all of a sudden it equips us and gives us the skill for life, not just life here on earth, but eternal life. Are you listening today? Amen. Should have had a couple better claps than that. That's okay. I know it's daylight savings time. Praise the Lord. Got to stir yourselves up, all right? Come on. Don't get lost. Get your wisdom today. Get your wisdom today. You say, but pastor, how do I get wisdom? Ah, oh, glad you asked. How do we get skill? How do we get wisdom? A couple things I want to take a look at today that will equip our lives to get skilled for life so that we are not unskilled, not partakers of milk only, but know that we move on to maturity in the things of God. How do we get skilled? How do we get wisdom? Number one, number one for today. Fear God. Fear God. Now, sometimes people don't understand the fear of the Lord. They think, oh, am I supposed to cower at him? I, I know God is mighty and he might smite me if I do something wrong. And is that what it means to be afraid of God? Well, in, in one sense, we see that in the word where Jesus talked about don't fear those who can kill your body and then do nothing afterwards. Fear God who can not only kill your body but cast your soul into hell. 
And, and, and we tremble at that and we say, oh, wow, that's fearful. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, the Bible says, for our God is a consuming fire. So, yes, there is that healthy fear being afraid, just like the ocean. You, 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 you don't turn your back on the waves. Why? Because one of them may come and knock you down. And so there is that healthy fear that's there. But even beyond that, above and beyond that, God has welcomed us in as his children and, and wants us to approach him and invites us into his presence. And so the real fear of the Lord is in awe, a respect, a value, a, a, a trembling at the word of God to where you fear the Lord, to when you get a hold of the wisdom of God and the word of God and the way of God, that now you are careful to observe it. What does that speak to? That speaks to priority in our life. That God is not just a priority, but he is the priority. Wow. See, that means every day you make God a priority. Every day when you wake up, God, yes, I'm living my life, but you're above and in my life. Yes, I, I, I've got a marriage here, but God, you're the priority in my marriage. Yes, I've got work, but God, you're the priority in my work. Yes, I've got children, but God, you're the priority in my children. Yes, I've got relationships, uh, uh, you know, recreation, things like that, but God, you're the priority in those things. Now, all of a sudden, that gets the wisdom of God in operation in your life. As you fear God, as you tremble at his word, you're careful to observe it. That means every day you get into the word of the Lord. Every day. Every day you get into the presence of God in prayer and in worship and praise. Every day. Not just at church. Yes, come to church. Get in the presence of God here. But at home. Man, go home and open up your Bible. You say, but pastor, when I take a look at this Bible, see how thick this is? I mean... That's a little overwhelming, like taking a drink out of a fire hose. I mean, that's, that's a lot. I can't do that every day. Yes, you can. You know how? Get one little verse. One little principle. Remember, line upon line, principle upon principle. Get a hold of the wisdom of God one thing at a time, one day at a time. See, oftentimes when I talk to people about starting a study of the Word of God, I tell them, you know, don't, don't start trying to, to read a whole chapter every day. Man, you're going to read that and go, my goodness, I didn't understand a word of what I just read. So read until you get a hold of something. When it comes alive and when the word starts to speak to you, get a hold of that. Does that mean close your Bible? It may. It may not. It may mean that you reread what you just read that spoke to you. Read it again. Read it again. Read it again. See, the fear of the Lord, it's to tremble at his word. It's to respect and honor and be in awe of God. So when God speaks, we listen. How about this? Write it down. God just spoke this to me through this verse. Talk to your husband or wife about it. Hey, honey, listen, listen, listen. I just, I just got a hold of some wisdom. I, I just got a hold of the word of God. Listen to what God is speaking to me. Let's do this. Uh, teach your children about it. Hey, kids, I want you to come here and listen. Listen to what mom or dad has to say. L -l listen, listen to what God just spoke to me. We, we got to get this in our lives. Put it, put it on a little post-it note and put it up on your, on your window so that when you're brushing your teeth, you can just be reading it over and over and over again. Memorize the word. Get it on the inside of you. Talk to your neighbors and your family about it. When you're at work and somebody says, hey, what's new? You say, listen, the word of God is new and alive in my life, and I got a hold of the wisdom of God. That's what it means to fear God. You're there in the book of Proverbs. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter number 9. Proverbs chapter number 9. And in Proverbs chapter number 9, let's take a look at verse number 10 together. Proverbs chapter number 9, verse number 10 says this. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. See, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is the first step on the road to wisdom. You want to live the right wiseness of God. You want to live God's will, God's way. you got to get the fear of the Lord. That's the place to start. You cannot go anywhere with the wisdom of God without starting at the fear of the Lord. That's where this all starts. You're there in Proverbs chapter number nine. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter one. Proverbs chapter one. The book starts out as explaining about a proverb, kind of setting up the understanding of what this is all about and giving us principles for wisdom. And in Proverbs chapter number one, right at the outset of this book of wisdom, verse number seven, Proverbs chapter one, verse number seven says this, the fear of the Lord, there it is again, is the beginning 
of knowledge. So the fear of the Lord not only is the beginning of wisdom, it's also the beginning of knowledge. you got to have knowledge to gain wisdom. Why? Because knowledge is what you know. Wisdom is the application of those things that you know. So if you start with the fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. But look at this. But fools. We could say immature people or babies despise wisdom and instruction. In other words, they don't fear God. Oh, I, I tried getting into the Bible. I read it. Yeah, not that big of a deal. It's just like any other ancient writing. It's okay. It's some good teachings. There is some wisdom in there, but you know what I, I've learned on my own? That's foolish. That's not fearing God. And you're not going to know anything or have any wisdom in your life because the fear of the Lord is just the beginning. It's just the start. Oh, I tried praying and God didn't answer my prayers. And I even believed my prayers when I prayed them, but it never happened. Well, how long did you pray? See, because I knew people that prayed for decades before they got an answer to their prayers. I know people that are still waiting after 30 years for prayers to be answered. What's that? That's the wisdom of God, that it's not my will, but it's his will. It's not my way, but it's his way. It's not my time, but it's his time. And if God chooses, then he is righteous and just in all his ways. That is the wisdom of God. It starts with the fear of the Lord. My goodness, every day make God the priority. Get into his word. Get into his presence. Get into prayer. My goodness, that's how we get skilled. Wisdom, number one, is fear God. Second thing, second thing for today, if we're going to get a hold of the wisdom of God, of how to get skilled, number two today, is cry out for it. Ask. Do you know that numerous times in the Bible, God invites us into his presence to ask? In fact, Jesus even told parables about it, that we shouldn't give up in our asking, that we should, we should be bold in our asking, and we should be fervent in our asking, and we should be diligent and unrelentless in our approach to the throne of God, and that we should make our requests known, and that we should come into the presence of God. See, sometimes we feel guilty because we've heard people say, oh, don't just ask God for things. No, praise God, thank God, worship God, uh, ask for forgiveness, you know, go and, and listen to God, but hey... He said, ask, so we should ask. And if we need wisdom, we need to cry out for it, and we need to ask for it. You're there in Proverbs chapter number one. Take a look at Proverbs chapter two. Proverbs chapter number two, starting in verse number one, says this, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then, 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 see, until you cry out, until you lift up your voice, nothing's going to happen. It's not just going to fall on you like dewdrops from heaven. That's not how this works. God said, ask. God said, cry out. God said, come and approach and lift up your voice. Day and night, the Bible says, cry out to him. Give him no rest. Wow. That's the terminology we find in the Bible. Until that happens, nothing's going to happen. Why? Because the level or the measure of interest and attention you use, it will be measured back to you. That's the principle of sowing and reaping in the Bible. So if you're not interested in your life, what makes you think God will be interested in your life in that way? God's interested in your life, but God said ask. But he already knows what I need. He's God. Of course he knows. But he said ask. My goodness. God wants us to activate heaven. It's almost as if all heaven is waiting. All the resources of heaven is at your disposal, and it's stationed there, ready to move, but waiting for you to ask. God, give me my wisdom. Bang, there it is. God pours it out on us. God opens it up. Then, then, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Verse number six, for the Lord gives wisdom. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. See, we're not going to get anything without the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is where it starts. 
And as we fear God and we come and we ask, then we will understand the fear of the Lord and God will give us his wisdom. Are you listening today? Very familiar verse when it comes to asking. James chapter 1, verse 5. Turn with me back. Uh, if, you, if you know where Hebrews is, your Bible may fall open to it if you've been around this place for any time. Turn right past the book of Hebrews to the book of James. James chapter 1. Very familiar verse talking about asking for wisdom. James chapter 1, verse number 5 says these words. James chapter 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, we got to stop right there and take a look at a couple of words. If we lack wisdom, if we don't know what to do in our situation, God, I don't know how to have a good marriage. God, I don't know how to raise children. God, I, I don't know how to do business. It's just me here, God. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have the education. I don't have the knowledge. I, I don't, I'm not cool. I don't have the looks. I don't have the talents. But God... I, I know you have the wisdom. God, I know you have the way for me. So God, I'm asking. Let him ask of God. Who does what? Who gives liberally and without reproach. Now, what does that mean? God gives liberally. That means that God doesn't give just a little tad bit. You know what I mean by tad bit? A little dabble, do ya? Oh, here you go. Here's, here's a little verse. Go ahead. Get out of my way. No, that's not God. God says, oh, you want wisdom? Oh, you're crying out? You're asking for it? You're passionate about it? You don't know what to do? You, you want some wisdom? Yeah, yes, God, I want wisdom. Give me the wisdom, God. God says, okay. And he dumps it on us, right? And, and, and God doesn't just give you one verse. Now, all of a sudden, because you've been asking, because it's passionate, because it's on your mind, you're thinking about it. Now, all of a sudden, every time you open the word, wow, wow, that, that, that speaks to me. That's what God, oh, that, it's over here too. Wait a second, wait, that, 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 that lines up with what I saw. And then pastor was preaching, over, and, and, and somebody came and talked to me, and they shared a verse with me, and it was just my situation. See, God doesn't just give you a little bit. God pours out his wisdom on you, and he shares with you what to do with your life. Pours out his wisdom. He gives liberally, abundantly, more than enough, and without reproach. What does that mean? That means God's not laughing at you. God's not sitting there, <laughs> stupid people. Of course you came to me for wisdom. I'm God. Here you go. No, God is saying, thank you. I'm glad you came. I was waiting. Now let me share with you, child, how to do this. Listen, if you do, and all of a sudden God's there with you without reproach. We shouldn't hang our head in shame. God, I guess I couldn't do it on my own. No, of course you couldn't do it on your own. We live in a fallen world in an earth suit. We got all this stuff against us. Devil's coming against us. Of course we need God. That's the way it's set up. We must rely on God. You cannot save yourself. You need the wisdom of God for salvation. So what makes us think that it's any less in our business, in our homes, with our spouse, with our children, winning people to Jesus? We need the wisdom of God. So we got to ask, and God will give it. That's what this is all about. If we find ourselves in a place of immaturity, lacking the wisdom of God, we just got to go and ask. We got to approach God will give it to us, and he will not make fun of us on the way. Are you listening today? Final thing for today. Number one, how to get skilled in wisdom is fear God. Number two is we got to cry out. we got to ask for it. Final thing for today is that we got to live in it. Now, I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I know at the beginning we talked about experience is not enough. But when you experience the results of the word of God, now you get skilled. It's like a, a master craftsman who has tools, Right? They could have all the tools that they need to build something. They could have all the manuals and have read them. But until they break out the materials and start to apply them, there's a feel, there's a touch, there's a sensitivity. Now, all of a sudden, as you live in it and as you work that thing out and get dusty, get dirty, now, all of a sudden, you get the wisdom, the skill for life. Same thing with a, uh, a, a sports person, right? They could have all the equipment. They could have all the shin guards, the knee pads, all that kind of stuff. They could have the ball, and they could know the manual of the game. And yet, until they get out there and get some grass stains on their knees, haven't done anything yet. 
that's where the rubber meets the road, is we have to not only know the word of God up here in our head, it's got to drop down into our heart, come alive on the inside of us, and then we apply it to our life, and now all of a sudden you see. Now all of a sudden you understand, and now all of a sudden you have the skill of life. And as you apply those principles to your life, it just gets gooder and gooder. Just like we talked about those incentives, now all of a sudden, hey, riches and honor. All of a sudden, man, I started applying the word of God to my life, and I had more than enough. Started applying the wisdom of God towards my finances. Man, God made provision. Started applying the word of God to my marriage, and all of a sudden, it wasn't grating and terrible to wake up every day. Now, all of a sudden, we're so in love, more in love than the day we met, more excited and passionate for one another in our marriage. Man, with my kids, they were going astray, but now I've applied the word of God, and now they're starting to come around, and I can see that they're going to go on for God. See, that is the skill of life when you apply the word of God and you live it out each and every day. Amen. Come on, come on, come on. Give God a praise. Because skill and wisdom does come when we experience and do the word of God. Ephesians chapter 5, we'll end with this today. Ephesians chapter 5, last verse for today. Ephesians chapter 5, talking about living in the word of God, the wisdom of God, getting skilled in the word of righteousness. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 15 says this. It says, see then that you walk circumspectly. Now, anytime you see the word walk, it means to live out your life. So see then that you live out your life circumspectly. What does that mean? Carefully. Be careful about your life. Be intentional about your life. Don't just float through life. Whatever happens, happens. Say la vie. Such is life, right? That's not what this is about. This is about us being careful, fearing God, asking him for the wisdom, and then carefully doing the word of God. See then you, that you walk circumspectly or carefully, not as fools, but as wise. Not as babes, but as full grown. Not as immature, but as mature. Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We know that the days are evil, but we're not going to fret. We're not going to be concerned. Why? Because we've got the wisdom of God. Verse 17, therefore, in other words, because of what I just said, that we are to be careful about our life, not be foolish, but be wise, and because the days are evil, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. God wants you to live out his word in your life. God wants you to take the wisdom that you get from him and apply it to every area of your life. And as you do, those incentives we talked about will start to come to pass. See, wisdom is a wise investment for each and every one of us. Getting hold of the wisdom of God is a wise investment because it will change the world that we live in. Let's turn back to Hebrews one last time. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 13, once again. Now the verse comes alive with meaning and explodes in our understanding. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13 says this. It says, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. And we know that those who get skilled in the word of righteousness, the right wisdom of God for our lives, now is mature and going on with God. What did we learn today? Well, we learned how to get skilled. Wisdom. Number one is we fear God. We tremble at his word. Every day we make him the priority. Secondly, we cry out for it. We ask. And finally, we live in it. If you got something from the word of God today, come on, give God a great big praise. Hey, I want to talk to you guys. You guys have been great today, by the way. Thank you for listening to the Word of God and stirring yourselves up and getting involved. I really do believe you got something from the Word of God and the wisdom of God today. But let's not stop there. Let's make sure that you have the wisdom of God for salvation. Sometimes in church, we're foolish because we think that just because people come to church that they're saved. They're right with God, going to heaven and denying hell. When did you know that nothing could be further from the truth? It's not about just sitting in church, calling yourself a Christian that makes you a Christian. That's like saying I could go down to Dodger Stadium, wear a Dodger uniform, bring my bat and my ball, sit in the dugout, and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out, and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a Dodger. You can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Come on, let's make sure that if you died today, that you'd go to heaven and wouldn't go to hell. Now, sometimes people take offense and say, oh, I don't believe in hell. You know, God's good and loving, and, and Jesus went to the cross, therefore I don't have to go to hell. Well, yeah, that's why he went to the cross, so that you didn't have to. But we can choose with our life while we're here on the earth where we go, whether to heaven or hell. Hell is a very real place. Old and New Testament talk about it. Jesus talked about it, described it. 
listen, God doesn't want you to go there. I don't want you to go there. And you don't want you to go there. So let's make sure that you don't end up in hell, that you go to heaven. Let's not just bury our head in the sand and say, I don't believe in it. It's like standing on the slow lane of the freeway. I don't believe in semi-trucks. Well, stand there long enough, you'll meet one face to face. You can't just deny hell's existence and think that you're going to get out of it just by doing that. Come on, let's talk today. What makes you think you're going to get to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I'm going to get to heaven because, uh, you know, all roads lead to heaven. You, you've got your truth, I've got my truth. We'll all get to heaven some way, our own way, and we'll make it there. God's good, he loves us. But listen, 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 how foolish that we would think that our wisdom would get us there instead of using God's wisdom. Not all roads lead to heaven. That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. No, you only get there one way. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried out in his son Jesus, don't you think if he went through all that, through the cross, the suffering, the agony, don't you think that he would tell us how to get to heaven? Well, he does. He outlines it for us in his word. Sometimes people think, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just rely on the fact that I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. They hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized your Christian as a child? You went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. And you've always considered yourself to be a Christian. Not any other religions. You're not Buddhist, Muslim, or Hindus. Therefore, you're a Christian, right? Wrong. You know that nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible. Say so you're raised in church. Parents tell you you're a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry, be baptized your Christian as a child, attend religious classes, that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere does it say you consider yourself to be a Christian or because you're born in America or because you're not some other religion that by default, God loves you in a category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. You say, but wait a second, Pastor Dan. Not only when I was a child did I go to church here, I'm sitting in church right now. No, well, we already covered that. Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. You say, but I got involved in my last church. I sang in the choir, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. Carried the pastor's Bible, he even taught in the Bible classes, got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible because your church involvement gets you into heaven. You're not going to make it. God is not looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. It doesn't work like that. You say, but I know God. I mean, I know about Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. That's great. Just show that to me in the Bible where that gets you into heaven. Having had knowledge about who Jesus is, celebrate a holiday, or you can quote scriptures. If you'd read your Bible, you'd know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's not a Christian headed for heaven. Even though he can quote scripture, you'll find that in your Bible. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. Having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven and denying hell. This is about your heart. Jesus made a statement like this. He said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Not do good works, not attend church, not be raised in church, not get involved or be born in America or any of those things that we discussed. No, you must be born again. Now, many times people turn off at that point and say, born again, that's that weirdo stuff. That's crazy. That's, that's uh, I don't want that. Well, you know why you got that idea about being born again? Because you watch movies, television, books, radio, internet, magazines. And yet, this is not about what society says about being born again. What does the Bible say? What's the wisdom of God? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. That's the wisdom of God for salvation. So simple, and yet many times we miss it. Don't miss it today. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Because if not, I love you enough to tell you the truth, you're not going to make it. It's all or nothing with God. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, the third chapter. Jesus, speaking to a church, said, I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow, those are some gross, graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he talking about? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, and occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three. When I say the number three, I'm going to pop my hands together just like this. Three. You hear that sound? Three. That's your opportunity to lift your hands. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. 
I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You had me until you said you were going to point and count. I mean, I'll be embarrassed if you point me out. Yeah, you might be, but get over it. Why? Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? And no one would make that trade. Come on, a moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell? Come on. You're much wiser than that. You wouldn't do that. But the devil's going to try and talk you out of it. See, Pastor, I feel like you're pushing me. Yeah, I am. You know why? Because the devil's pushing you into hell. I'm trying to get you into heaven. God wants you to be with him forever and ever. So come on, push past the embarrassment. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better. Jesus said, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. Count, put it right back down. Cool. But he said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. Sit there and do nothing. I'll get your hand up if you know you need to get right with God. All across this auditorium, back in the families, wherever you're at, watching my television, the Foyer Love Rock Cafe, online. Hey, come on, get ready. Get ready. God's watching you right where you're at. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this? Never said yes to Jesus, giving him all your heart and life. Come on, I'm talking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a right with relationship with God today. Come on. Let's get our hands up today if that's you, if you need to. Wherever you're at, I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. Who else today? Who else today? Oh, come on. Come on. You know you need to do this. Three, four. Thank you. Five. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Real quick. You know you need to give God. I got five, four or five wise people. Anybody else real quick? Come on, come on. Thank you. Six, seven, got you. Eight, got you over there. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? Who else today? About eight wise people. They're pointing over this way. Wave it at me if I don't see you already. Anybody else? Got you right there. Thank you. Thank you. Nine. We're at number 10. Sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Go for it. Who else today? No, you need to give God all your heart and all your life. About nine wise people. Don't you just feel 10? Number 10, here's what you're thinking right now. God's calling you out. You're sitting there wondering, should I do this? Is he talking to me? Yep, I am. Come on, if that's you, God just read your mail. Called you out, come on. Will you be bold enough to say, yeah, that's me. I need to do this. Anybody else? Thank you, number 10. God bless you. Who else? Who else today? Come on, come on, come on. Don't miss this opportunity. You missed enough opportunities. Don't go on your wisdom, go on God's wisdom. Give God all your heart and all your life. Anybody else real quick? 10 wise people already. Will you join them? Didn't embarrass them, I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, come on, come on. If that's you, just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for 10 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good. All right, all 10 of you, you're number 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. You should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front. No one leave during this time. We're all going to stand and welcome them, give them a clap to encourage them to come, okay? But it's very hard to get them to come forward if you're leaving backward, okay? So we're going to stand in a moment, give a clap and a shout. If that's you, you raise your hand. You should have raised your hand. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. Come on, let's welcome them as they come. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on, come on, come on. Won't you come to stand? You can come right now. Just make your way to the front. They're coming. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. You want to bring your children? Hey, they're welcome. They'll remember this. Bring them on down. They're welcome from the family rooms, from the foyer. Come on in. Come on in right now. Hallelujah. Can come to this is your time this is your moment anybody else it's not too late get up here hallelujah hallelujah god is so good so good come on come on there's room for you a lot more than 15 people up here. Praise God. That is, that is so cool, so awesome. Hey, everybody up front, I want you to look up here. Do this. Put a smile on your face, okay? Because there's 
great things ahead of you. You're going to be born again and you're starting to operate according to the wisdom of God and all those incentives we talked about, life, happiness, those things are coming your way as you apply the wisdom of God. Now I want to introduce a friend of mine to you right over here to my right, waving his Bible at you. This is Pastor Joel. Okay, Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, this is about as weird as you're going to encounter today. He's cool, okay? He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance. Number one thing he's going to do is lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, brand new on the inside. But now you need to know what to do. So the second thing he's going to do is going to give you some free stuff. Everybody loves getting free stuff. We love giving away free stuff. So that's a good relationship already. He's going to give you a couple little booklets that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Invest maybe a half hour. Sit down and read it. Read it slow if you want to. Still only be about a half hour. Okay? Easy reading and basically it'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Listen, we invest a lot of time into movies, television, phone conversations, even video games longer than that. You can invest a half hour. Sit down and find out what to do next in your walk with God. Finally, he's going to introduce you to a friend in the church that we call an SPT. What is that? Well, that's a spiritual personal trainer. We want to help you personally, one-on-one, with a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. It's easy. It's free. You need to do this, okay? Now, I'm going to ask something of you, but I'm also going to promise you something with what I ask. I'm going to ask you, give us a year here at this church, one year, sitting under the teaching, getting hold of the wisdom of God here at The Rock. Now, here's the promise. At the end of that year and for the rest of your life, you'll be so blessed, you'll say, I didn't know it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Okay, there's, there's some witnesses right there, all right? If you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.